Welcome everyone in the International Economic Groupings course and the topic of international trade arrangements, the GATT and the World Trade Organization. The purpose of this lecture is to discuss international economic cooperation among countries in trade-related aspects. In this respect, we are going to start with the historical background that led to the formation of the GATT and consequently the World Trade Organization. This background contains some U.S. trade policies that contributed to the need to create a multilateral trade platform which encourages trade liberalization. To this end, we are going to discuss the Smoot-Hawley Act of 1930, which supported trade protectionism, in addition to Reciprocal Trade Agreement Act, which favored trade liberalization and created the most favored nations clause that laid the foundation of the GATT principles. Second, we are going to discuss the formation of the GATT. To achieve this goal, a discussion of the GATT members, principles, exceptions, multilateral trade rounds that eventually led to the formation of the WTO is needed. Finally, we are going to discuss the formation of the WTO and how it differs from the GATT, its role in settling trade disputes among countries, and its impact on the environment. Now, let's start the discussion by the historical background. The Great Depression played a key role in sparking the need for trade liberalization. It was initiated by a collapse of the U.S. stock market in late 1929. Then the world e economy experienced a slowdown afterward. As you already know, when an economy goes into deep recession, the country experiences a considerable decline in its national output which consequently leads to a massive increase in unemployment rates. And this is exactly what happened in USA. As a result, domestic industries sought protection against foreign products. And at the same time, American workers called for higher tariff rates to help save their jobs in the import competing industries. In this respect, higher tariffs have the effect of increasing cost of imported goods, which encourages consumers to buy domestically produced products. This in turn helps to stimulate demand in the import competing industries and ultimately increase jobs in these sectors. Based on these circumstances, the Smooth Hawley Act was passed in 1930, despite many petitions signed by foreign producers to stop this act. As a result, many U.S. trading partners retaliated against USA by raising tariff rates on U.S. imports. For example, Italy increased its tariff rates on imports of American autos. Moreover, countries took other retaliatory actions such as currency devaluation. These protectionist policies by several countries led to the collapse of international trade. Now, let's turn to the Reciprocal Trade Agreement Act. As U.S. trade collapsed with many countries and President Roosevelt won the presidential elections, more liberal trade policies were pursued. In 1934, Congress passed the Reciprocal Trade Agreement Act. This act transferred authority from Congress to the President in shaping trade policies. This procedure helped considering the national interest instead of the policies pursued by the Congress, which favored domestic import competing producers. At the same time, this act was characterized by, by two attributes. First, bilateral reciprocal concessions, and second, generalized concessions. Well, what is, what is meant by reciprocal concessions? Under this act, the President was authorized to negotiate bilateral tariff reduction agreements with other countries without congressional approval. However, in order for a country to enjoy the tariff reduction offered by USA, it must reduce its tariff tariffs on its US imports. This means that I would lower my tariff barriers towards your products only if you agree to lower yours against my products. This is something of mutual benefit. The second feature was providing generalized tariff reduction. 
This was done by creating a clause known as Most Favored Nation, or MFN. It is an agreement between two countries to apply tariffs to each other as low as those apply to any other nation having MFN status. Okay, but also what does this really mean? Well, according to this law, if two countries negotiate reciprocal tariff reduction, this preferential treatment must be automatically extended to any other country having MFN status. This means that tariff reductions should be applied on a non-discriminatory basis. For example, if USA grants MFN status to Brazil and then lowered its tariffs against French machinery, America is obligated to lower its tariffs against Brazilian machinery as well to the same levels. Now, let's turn our analysis to the GATT. But first of all, what does the GATT stand for? The GATT stands for the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. It was intended to be a part of the International Trade Organization. The International Trade Organization was intended to represent the third arm of the Bretton Woods institutions that aimed at trade liberalization. However, the ITO was never created. Only the GATT part was agreed upon by 23 countries who signed this agreement in 1947 to reduce trade barriers among member countries on a non-discriminatory basis. The GATT system reflects the US-UK approaches as a rules-based system with specific commitments by member countries in an attempt to liberalize trade. It focused on trade in goods only. It did not deal with trade in services or investment aspects or labor mobility. The overriding principle of the GATT was to ensure non-discriminatory trade of treatment of traded goods. But what does non-discriminatory treatment mean? This reflects the commitment of member countries that their trade policies do not treat any member country's goods more or less favorably than another members other members. Also, domestic regulations of member countries do not treat their domestic goods more favorably than imported goods. Therefore, the non-discrimination principle involved two pillars, the most favored nation and national treatment. The first pillar of most favored nation implies the same rules used in the Reciprocal Trade Agreement Act in USA. It means that all countries of the GATT are equally favored. For example, if Germany lowers its tariffs on paper imports from Italy, it must apply the same tariff rates to imports of this good from any other GATT member. Now, let's turn to the second pillar, which is national treatment. It deals with applying the same rules, such as tax, taxes, health and safety standards, technical specifications on both domestic products and comparable in imported goods. For example, if a country imposes a tax on cigarettes, then national treatment requires the country to apply the same tax rates on imported cigarettes from any GATT member and do not discriminate against these imports. Now, let's turn to the second principle of GATT, which is reciprocal concessions, which was already discussed. I and and this means that I reduce my trade barriers against your products only if you agree to reduce your, yours against my products. This represents an effective strategy for countries to reduce their trade barriers. Another important principle is binding commitment. This principle means that you write down your maximum tariff rates, which, which is called pound rates, and you are committed not to raise your tariffs beyond this limit except under specific circumstances. 
also an important principle is ensuring transparency among members. In this respect, members are required to be clear about their international trade commitments and disclose their trade policies. They write down their tariff schedules and other members can see them. A final key principle that aimed at promoting free trade was the role of the GATT in trade dispute, uh, dispute settlement. It offers members the ability to complain against unfair trade practices and provides a conciliation panel that offers recommendation to solve the dispute. However, one weakness of the GATT was that the conciliation panel's recommendation was not binding to its members. Of course, there were some exceptions to the GATT principles. These exceptions include, for example, developing countries. The developing countries had limited involvement in the GATT. There were fewer commitments in terms of trade liberalization. Also, they were not required to provide the same reciprocal tariff reduction as developed countries. Another exception was, was with respect to most favored nation principle and free trade agreements. The GATT allows members that engage in preferential trade agreements to get better treatment than any other WTO member, which is considered an exception to the MFN principle. For example, the NAFTA which is a free trade agreement between USA, Canada, and Mexico having zero trade barriers among themselves, but they do not extend this treatment to other GATT or WTO members. Now, let's talk about the multilateral trade rounds that took place under the GATT. Discussions that took place before certain commitments are decided were called negotiating rounds. During any round, the agreement about certain commitments is reached by consensus, which means that a round is finalized only when each member agrees with the required commitment. These rounds led to substantial tariff reductions in developed countries and some initial agreement on non-tariff barriers. The most important round was the Uruguay round. It focused on important aspects such as non-tariff barriers, intellectual property rights, and trade in services and agriculture. A critical achievement by the Uruguay round was the creation of the WTO, or the World Trade Organization, which transformed the GATT from an informal agreement into a formal international institution. At this point, we are going to talk about the World Trade Organization, or the WTO, in more detail. The World Trade Organization was created in 1995, and it is headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland. Today, the WTO consists of 167 members, accounting for more than 97% of world trade. To discuss the, the WTO in more details, there is an important question that arises. How the WTO differs from the GATT? The WTO differs from the GATT in many respects. First of all, the WTO is a formal international institution, not just an agreement as the GATT. Although the WTO stick to the same GATT principles, it has a wider scope. It extended trade liberalization to include trade in services, intellectual property rights, and investment. Also, the WTO liberalized trade in certain sensitive areas such as agriculture and textiles. Remember, the WTO also has a large database and requires its members to update various trade measures and statistics and report them to the WTO. Now, let's turn to a key aspect that differentiates the WTO from the GATT, which is the Trade Dispute Settlement. The old GATT dispute settlement mechanism suffer, suffered from long delays and lack of enforcement mechanism. 
However, under the WTO, the trade dispute settlement process is as follows. First, a country can file a complaint against another country's unfair practices or violation of any of the WTO principles. Second, after initial set of consultations, the parties involved would, uh, would choose a panel of experts and the role of this panel is to assess whether the accused country has committed this violation. The accused party can then take the decision of the, of the panel to an appellate body. But if the final decision was that the accused country has committed the, this violation, then there are three scenarios that could take place. The first scenario is that for the accused party to change its policies. For example, if a country ha has imposed taxes on foreign imports higher than the taxes imposed on domest domestically produced goods, in, uh, uh, and the appellate body uh, or the, the panel, that the panel's decision was that this was a violation of the WTO's principles, then the country can, can have the option to change its policies by unifying the tax rates on both the foreign products and the similar domestically produced ones. The second scenario is that if the country does not change its policies, the affected party has a right to take retaliatory actions with the approval of the WTO. Third, or the third scenario is for the accused party to compensate the affected one by offering, for example, lower tariff rates in, on other areas or any other preferential treatment that would compensate the affected party. Therefore, we can see that the WTO has a more effective mechanism of settling trade disputes than the GATT. Well, thank you for listening and see you in next lectures.